good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good, good to see you. It's like almost, I mean, it's almost over morning, so, you, but it is still morning. Sometimes we have a j joke in our house that sometimes the boys don't wake up until morning. They miss morning. You know what I'm talking about? Sorry. It's the truth. Uh, <laughs> so my name is Pastor Jason. I'm the lead pastor. It's Name Tag Sunday. So if you have your name tag on, you know, you, how many people snuck a look this at like the meet and greet time? You're like, oh, that's that. Now that's his name. Like so handy, so helpful. Well, this morning we are going to be wrapping up the book of James. So give yourself a hand. You made it through. <laughs> Finishing James and Genesis in the same week. That's kind of not planned. Some of you will be like, oh, we're not plants. But it turned out that way. Genesis has been really good. I'm really looking forward to starting Matthew. So Wednesday night should be a good time. Bible study. Um, this morning, Deborah and I were talking about, it was funny, she was listening to a message while she was getting ready. And um, she was like, oh, this guy used this really uh, like appropriate um, analogy for James. Because he was talking about, you know, doing being a doer and um and I was like oh that's so funny I just listened to that I had listened to it earlier in the week and had thought about it so this isn't my story and this actually wasn't even his story he made that clear he's like I didn't actually do this but just imagine if I did so he was talking about how it was his job when they were getting married to plan the honeymoon right the, that connected with me because that was also my job like my wife planned the wedding, and I got to plan the honeymoon, right? And I thought that was like a fair trip. Like, the wedding is just a day. I got the whole, like, week. So that was good. <laughs> Any other guys, like, that was your job? Like, you got married, and you planned the honeymoon? Anybody? All right, few. So he, this, is his, this was his story, his analogy. It wasn't real, but he was like, so imagine if my wife was like, hey, listen, you're going to plan the honeymoon. I'm planning the wedding. You do the honeymoon. Um, I want you to plan it, make the reservations, take care of it. And, and so he's like, yes, got it, done. And then, so the next week, uh, he's, uh, you know, she comes and he's like, yep, I'm on it. I've memorized your instructions. I know your desires. Oh, I'm, I'm on it. It's going to happen. And then the next week, she comes. She's like, hey, so uh, did you plan the honeymoon? Make the reservations. Take care of all that stuff. He's like, listen. I made a note card, I stuck it on my bathroom mirror, it's actually in the car, I have a sticky note on the dash, I won't forget the reservations you want, I won't forget your heart, your desire, I will, your hopes, I've got it locked down. Next week, hey, so did you get the, like, plan the honeymoon, you made the reservations, took care of all that stuff, you know what, I actually got together with a group of guys, and we talked about the honeymoon and your desires and your hopes and what you wanted to do on the honeymoon. We talked about it. We actually prayed about it. And it, it was a really sweet time. I actually got emotional because it was so powerful. And then the next week, she's like, all right, so you make the reservation. She take care of planning the honeymoon. He's like, you know what? It is so dear to me. We have <laughs> prayed. We, I've memorized it. It's on my dashboard. We had small group about it. I, I have got emotional like, it is so important to me. And she's like, listen, idiot, have you done anything? Right? Sorry if that's an offensive word to you. Like, listen, you foolish man I'm about to marry, she's probably thinking, have you actually done anything? He's like, oh, no, but I've thought a lot about it. Now, that's really the book of James, right? James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a what? A doer. You have to do it. If you have sat through all the Sundays that we've gone through the book of James, and you're not doing something different, you've wasted a lot of time. You've, there's a lot of beautiful Sundays, <laughs> and all you're doing is hearing it. You and I have to be doers, or it doesn't really matter. And so many times, like, we memorize the verse, and we talk about the verse, and we pray about the verse, and, you know, all the things about the verse, except for actually doing it, right? We, there's so many things to do in James. We've been talking about James is, is a biblical building code, right? But it doesn't do you any good if you don't put into practice the building code, right? If you just read the building code for, you know, 
your own entertainment or you want to go to sleep or something, <laughs> right? But you don't actually do it in your house when the inspector comes, not approved, right? I, I think they stick stickies or something on it. It's like, this isn't up to code. That's not up to code, <laughs> right? When the storms come, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to stand. And you're like, I went to church every Sunday. I had small group. I memorized scripture. Why is my house falling apart? Because when the Bible said to be slow to speak, you weren't. <laughs> right? When the Bible said to forgive, you didn't. When the Bible said to give, you wouldn't. And so your house doesn't stand. It's not strong. You and I have to do, not just know. So we have to do. And last, last week we talked about the, the biblical perspective on suffering, the biblical perspective on pain. And honestly, if you, if you weren't here last Sunday, it's online. I really recommend that you walk through that because he gives us an example of the prophets. And he's like, listen, the prophets, these godly men, they suffered. And you and I, sometimes we think like, oh, if I'm, if I'm good, if I do the right thing, if I obey God and I go to church, I do all the things, like I'm not going to suffer. It's, it's going to be all good all the time. And he uses the prophets as an example. He's like, it doesn't work like that. We all suffer. We all have pain. We all have difficulty. That's, that's the reality. And the thing that's interesting about this is that he uses the prophets as an example and that's really important to understand is that we don't just read the Bible for knowledge. We read the Bible for an example. A lot of times people are like, why do we have the Old Testament? The New Testament, Paul actually tells us what's important about the Old Testament. He's like, it's an example. It's an example for you on what life looks like and what life is and how to apply these New Testament principles in life. Okay, so... What is important about the example is we just started, uh, started with our staff a book I've referenced a couple times, like the other half of church. And it's talking about brain science, the other half of your brain being used. And, and part of what is spiritual formation, part of what happens in spiritual formation isn't just about knowledge. It isn't just about learning a verse or understanding. It's actually about seeing. It's about Learning by seeing. I mean, if you think nowadays, like, if you want to learn how to do something, if you're not sure of how to do something, you know where most people go now to? YouTube. <laughs> right? They go to YouTube. Why? Like, I want to, what? See it. And when you go on YouTube, it's not a guy just, like, talking to you, not a girl just talking to you. Usually, they're doing something, right? They're showing what they've done and how they've done it. And you're, you, in the same way grow spiritually spiritual growth isn't just taught it's caught you catch it by being in community so that's why we study God's word and that's why we stay in community that's why we come to church it's not just like you know God's happy I went to church it's like no you've learned how to be a Christian because you've seen Christians so like we, why you sit in a group of people, a small group, and talk and share because you can see what it looks like. Oh, this is what it looks like to be married and a Christian. This is what it looks like to be in business and be a Christian. This is what it looks like to have kids and be a Christian. This is what it looks like to be single and be a Christian. So as we're in community, we learn, right? We learn these things. And so the Bible gives us information, but it also gives us examples and then we do those things and become an example. So this morning, our title for the message is simply, what do we do? When you think of a Christian, what do we do? What are the things that we actually do so that we can have a life that's pleasing to God and fruitful in the kingdom? What do we do? Well, James is going to give us, as he has been very faithful to, he's going to give us some very definite do's. Some very definite things like, hey, this is what it looks like if you're a Christian. And, he, and he's going he's gonna to use like uh, community kind of conversation words like among us and one another. Because you can't live out the Christian life by yourself. It's all built to be with one another. The big idea is 
This is what it looks like to have a real relationship with Christ and one another. This is what it looks like. So James is going to say, I'm going to give you five points this morning. And these points are we points. These are, this is what we do as believers, as followers of Christ. So James starts off, uh, we're going to look at chapter 5. We're going to finish James today. Chapter 5, verse 12, very exciting. Let's pray. If you can open up your Bible, your app, I'll put it up on the screen for you as well. But um, let's come to the Lord. Um, God, we do pray for your spirit to speak to your people today. God, that, that our hearts would be open. That if we've wandered or if we've grown cold or we've been distracted, um, God, that you'd draw us back. Lord, if we're just, just excited and cheerful and thankful, God, we give you praise. We, we thank you for the seasons of life and we thank you that you remain the same through every season. And we pray that you'd speak and move and that you would help us to act on what we know today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, verse 12. It says, but above all. James says, but above all. So all these different things, he's like, okay, this is a big thing. It's a weird big thing to me. Like, there, above all, I would think he would say something else, but this isn't important to him, and it's important for us to know. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. So we're not just talking like four-letter words here. Like, that's not what he's talking about, really. He's like, don't swear or make an oath by heaven or earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. So what is, what is he talking about here? He, he, he's saying, listen, be trustworthy. Be trustworthy. Don't have to make a bunch of big oaths. I don't know about you, but when, it, when I read this, I go to Peter. Do you remember Peter? Peter's denying the Lord with oaths right people come to him Jesus is being crucified he's he's betrayed all this stuff is happening Jesus Peter's over there like warming himself with the fire and people are like hey aren't you with him aren't you aren't you, you look like a galleon I think you sound like I think that's I think you're a follower of Jesus and he's like I swear I swear I'm not right so many times why do we swear we swear because people don't trust us to tell the truth or we're not trust or we're not telling the truth Somebody just says yes or no. Like it's clear. It's simple. Right? It's true. It's like the first point this morning is this. Who are we? We are trustworthy. We are trustworthy as Christians. We don't lie. We don't hide the truth. We don't try to trick people or take advantage or cheat people out of something. Like as believers, our yes should be yes. Our no should be no. You're selling something and you're like, oh, I swear this is going to be the best. It's just like, okay, uh, immediately I'm like, oh, okay, why are you swearing? Why are you making this big oath, right? Yes, yes, no, no. Now the interesting thing is James is quoting almost straight from the Sermon on the Mount. Remember Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. We'll get into Matthew in, uh, next month, excited about that. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus said again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. He's like, I know that you think like, hey, if you make an oath, if you swear, you should fulfill it. It's like, that is true. But honestly, don't even make an oath. Don't even swear. Just Let your yes be yes and your no, no. You don't have any control over anything else. And that's what James said earlier. He is like, hey, listen, if you're going to make a plan, it's foolish and arrogant for you to say, hey, I'm going to do this next year. I'm going to do that in five years. Just add on in your head and in your words, if the Lord wills, right? If the Lord wills. Now, this, this, uh, this example here is kind of tucked in between suffering. He's talking about suffering here. He's going to talk about suffering in just a second. And so these oaths, it's kind of the context of suffering. And I don't know know if you've ever experienced this or had this thought. But a lot of times we swear or make oaths when things are hard. Right? You have a situation and you're just like, okay, God, if you would just, if I swear I will do this. Right? And they're normally things that we should already be doing anyway. But it's like, oh, God, if you just get me out of this problem, I'll never lie again. 
you got into that problem for lying, but you're like, I swear, God. Right? Or uh, if you heal me from this sickness, I'll tithe every week. I, if you help me pay this bill, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to a missionary. <laughs> right? You're like, okay, you just take care of your bill. Okay? You don't have to make a big thing about it. Right? Like, we're making these deals. We, we swear. Uh, if you save me from this situation, I'll go to church every Sunday. I don't care how boring it is. <laughs> right? Like, that, that's not a mature relationship. That's not a mature relationship. Jacob started there. If you, you know, remember through Genesis, Jacob started, he's a schemer. He's making deals. But at the end of his life, that's not where he's at. He's not making deals and swearing and having oaths. He's giving blessings. Right? He's trusting in God's goodness and his grace. And so as God's people, we keep our word. Because God keeps his word. Right? So we follow him. It's super simple. Just be trustworthy. Don't have to swear and make oaths and all this kind of thing. Now the next couple of verses, he lays out a few situations. He gives us a few situations that we might find ourselves in. And then he gives us some guidance. Okay, he's like, okay, if this is happening in your life, do this. If this is happening in your life, do that. Verse 13 and 14, he says, is anyone among you suffering? You don't have to raise your hands. Let him pray. That's what he says. If you're suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you, notice among you, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So there's three kind of issues that are happening here. You could be suffering. You could be cheerful. You could be sick. And he's kind of walking it out. He's like, okay, this is what it looks like. So here's our second point this morning. Very simply, James says, pray. So we share are suffering in prayer that's it pray share with God he doesn't say like if you're suffering moan <laughs> if you're suffering whine and complain right he's like no, if you're suffering pray and he doesn't even say pray that it would stop he just says pray now some of us, like, we pray naturally. It's just like, man, something happens, and you're like, oh, I'm going to pray. Maybe you grew up in a home, and it was like, hey, we pray, let's pray about this. And, and so that's your habit. That's your, that's, you know, your thing. It's, it's more than just rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. <laughs> right? It's a little deeper prayer life. And that's great. And then other times we grow up, and, and we're not used to praying. Or we think praying is weak. It's a cop-out. Like, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to take care of this. I'm not going to pray about this. I mean, I'll reserve like the big stuff. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll pray about that. But this, I, I, I'm going to handle this. Prayer is not weakness. It's not a cop out. It's not a waste of time. It's a connection with God. How do you have a relationship with someone that you never talk to? <laughs> right? So what he's saying, he's like, hey man, if you're suffering, pray. Tell your dad about it. Right? Talk to your family. He's like, Heavenly Father wants to hear your prayer. So you may pray that it ends. You may pray that he gives you strength. You just may pray and say, this hurts. Just pray. Have a connection. That's what God is looking for. That's what God desires. And a lot of times we don't realize that, and we talked about this a little bit last week, but like it is our weakness that brings connection. I've heard people say, and I think I've said it, like, People will respect you for your strength, but they connect with you because of your weakness, right? In my weakness, he actually shows up strong. That's the reality. That's the biblical perspective. So if you're suffering, pray. Don't hold it in. Let it out and let him know. Then he goes and he says, if you're cheerful, sing psalms. He's like, hey, if you're having a good day, Awesome. Give God praise. Uh, you know, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. So give him praise. And I think a lot of times we're just real quick to see the, the, the bummer. We're, just, we're quick to see the thing that's wrong. We're, we're quick to point out the thing that's like, you know, a hundred things are good, but this one thing is wrong, and so that's the one, right? I, I sent out a survey a couple weeks ago. A few of you filled it out. Appreciate it. 
right? And, and what do I do? I'm like looking for the negative ones. It's like, oh, this is great. I'm really thankful for this. And then I'm like, oh, that person, no, okay. Let me try to fix that, <laughs> right? We just, naturally, we do that. But a lot of times, whatever you're looking for, you're going to find. So what are you looking for? Are you looking some, for something to give God praise? If you're cheerful? This morning, uh, we have prayer at 8.30 before service. We just gather around. Anybody that's around wants to pray. And I was like, okay, like 10, uh, scale of 10, 1 to 10, how do you feel? Somebody was like 12. <laughs> wow. He's a newlywed, so good for you. <laughs> right? 10 out of 10. Somebody else was like 5. Right? What we have in our lives are different. Like sometimes we're suffering and sometimes we're cheerful. So what do we do when we're cheerful? Third thing, third point. We share our joy in praise. We share our joy in praise. So give God praise. The Bible says in Proverbs that a cheerful heart is good medicine. So sing, give your praise. Don't just hold it in. Don't just like, you know, suppress it. Find those things, find those people and share it. Make their day. Right? Like, be a blessing as you share your praise. It's, it's a sweet thing. So then what if you're sick? That's what he says. If you're sick, he says, call the elders. Now, a lot of different, you know, Bible scholars, they have like, they, they kind of struggle through this. It's pretty simple. And it's something that we do. So I'm actually going to ask any of the elders that are here at this service to come up because I want you to see who our elders are. So... If any of your elders, if any of our elders, uh, we have nine elders. Give them a hand. So we have nine elders uh, and me. I'm one of the elders. So there's 10 of us. And this church is an elder run church. And so um, we make decisions as a group. Um, and come on, come on all the way over here. Um, so a couple of people are traveling. A few people came to first service. But um, I just wanted you to see these guys love to pray with people. So this is something that we do. We anoint people with oil and pray for them. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Um, and we, we love, it's something that we love to do. Why do we love to pray for people? Doug, you want to, you got the mic. I'm happy to. Um, the ability to pray for members of this body is such a blessing to us. We don't think it's a right that we have. We think it is, you're honoring us by giving us an opportunity to pray with you. Um, and we are completely blessed by what happens. Um, sometimes people look and think, well, is that the God Squad? Or are those the guys of the you know, Committee of Last Rites? And we are definitely not that. <laughs> we are definitely neither one of them. Um, we just feel we are privileged to have an opportunity to come alongside you. And it's not just a one-time deal. We are happy to pray with you whenever you feel the need or the desire. Um, and for whatever reason. We'd be happy to come together and to praise. But uh, one of the things that's happened is that part of our job is, prior to COVID, let's say, we were able to go into the hospitals. Um, people would come and say, would you come to the hospital and pray with me? Or come to the hospital, my dad is drawing last breaths and things like that. And what an amazing blessing for us to be able to do that. A little frightening at first when you think about it, but when you get there and you realize the peace that somebody no scripture enough to call for the elders to come and to pray with them. Um, incredible blessing for us. Right, right. When you think, the, when is one of the last times we got together and knowing to somebody with oil bag? Do you remember? Yeah. Sadly, probably a month ago. Yeah. I wish I could say yesterday. I yeah. wish I could say five times this week. Yeah. Um, but it isn't. Probably a month ago. Right. So these guys need things to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they want to pray for you. If you're sick and you have like a, a, you know, you need prayer, don't be shy. This, this is one of the things that we are, are blessed and giving a blessing and being able to pray. This, this group of elders um, is such a great group of people that love God, love each other. It's like, it's my favorite small group. We get together every month and um, we make decisions and pray through things. And just last week, when we met a uh, week before, we were talking about praying. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. So I just want you to see their face. If you need some prayer, these are a few of our elders. So give them a hand. <laughs> Thanks, sir. So simple. The Holy Spirit, is, the, the oil rather, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So James says, like, anoint them with oil, pray for them. And, and then he says there's going to be a result. 
Like, what happens? Well, go to the next verse. It says, verse 15, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Like, that's what he says. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. You remember in Scripture, there's, there's a man that Jesus, uh, you know, he dropped to the roof. His friends brought him to Jesus, the elder, right? And, and what did Jesus do? He, he said, your sins are forgiven you. Right? Because of Christ, we can be forgiven. So God forgives, God heals, God works. What do we need? What do you need? Faith. That's it. That's all you need. You need faith. How much faith? Do I need a lot of faith? Like, do I need big faith to have God do a big thing? Let me just tell you. You don't need big faith. You need faith in a big God. Right? Like, if there's a man that's drowning, he just... He needs to have a rope faith, right? It's just small, it's, it's little, but it's just a rope. But that rope is attached to a boat. And if the rope is attached to a boat, then that's all the faith that you need. It's not the amount of faith that you have. It, it's the person that you have faith in that matters, right? It's the, it's the place you put your faith that matters. And we put our faith in God. God is the one who heals. Sometimes he heals immediately. Sometimes he heals eventually. Sometimes he heals in heaven. But God heals and God forgives. And so all we need to do is come and pray. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too ugly that he can't heal or forgive. And we come seeking that. And then in verse 16, it's a unique verse actually. Um, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But verse 16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Remember, this is a context of community. How do we live out this Christian life? Well, we have to have the one another's. So confess your trespasses to one another is the first thing he says. It's kind of unique because there's not anywhere else in scripture where it talks about confessing to one another. And a lot of times people get a little bit messed up and think like, I have to confess my sin to my pastor or my priest or, you know, whatever. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator that we need. We come to Christ, right? Jesus is the one that forgives our sins. But in this context, it's a different word for confess. A common word for confess is to agree. So if I agree one with another, I'm confessing. Like, if God says this is sin... And I agree and I say this is sin, I confess. That is sin, please forgive me, I'm confessing. And I'm going to probably butcher the Greek out of this, but I'm going to tell you the first word confess is homologeo. Now homologeo means to agree, say the same thing. But this isn't homologeo here in James, it's exomologeo. Exomologeo, like this is a different aspect of confession. What, is it, what does it mean? Well, it means to confess or profess or acknowledge openly and joyfully. See, so when I'm, when I'm coming to my one another, whoever that happens to be, and I'm confessing my trespasses, it's building community. It's building connection. It's humility. It's vulnerability that is... I'm admitting, just yesterday, I went to the men's group, Saturday morning, good time, Andy was teaching, great study about the schemes of the devil and what, you know, how we need to be uh, vigilant. And at the table, we shared, like, okay, what are those schemes that you fall prey to? And it was a time of like, hey, I'm going to own this. This is the way that I am struggling. This is the trespass that I committed. And there's connection and there's vulnerability and that in that confession there's healing, right? And so maybe it's with your spouse and you need to confess. You need to openly acknowledge and own it. Maybe it's with somebody that you work with or some friend that you have or, you know, some relationship where it's like, hey, I need to confess. And it's humbling and it's embarrassing and it hurts and it's healthy, <laughs> right? Vulnerability is really healthy. There's there's shortcomings that are acknowledged, right? There's uh, weaknesses that are admitted. And, and there's connection that happens. There's, there's a coming together to seek the Lord together. So he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And, and people are realizing 
this idea of vulnerability and confession and profession, like it's healthy, it's important. That's why God says to do it. I was, Deborah and I were having this conversation about vulnerability. I, I don't know what you think of when you think of vulnerability, but I think of a dog. So our friends Greg and Nicole have this dog named Daisy. And she's the sweetest, like most vulnerable dog. The first thing, like if she's super excited to see you, she pees on the floor. It's very vulnerable. We wish she would stop that part of it. But right afterwards, you know what she does? She just like rolls over. She's like... It's like rolls over right on, on her back and exposes her belly. Now, if I was a jerk, I could just be like, donk, and like hit her right in the gut, right? She'd be like, oh, sad. You'd be like, oh, that's so mean, right? She doesn't do that. Why? Because she trusts the people that she lives with. She's learned that if I roll over and show you my belly, what happens? You're going to rub it, right? Oh, that's a good girl, right? You like, it's a vulnerability that brings connection. And that's what the Lord is looking for. The Lord, some of us are like, I'm not going to be vulnerable with the Lord. I'm not going to confess this. I'm not going to be open with this. Because we've gotten thumped. We've gotten hurt. And we think God has a hammer. And he's just waiting. It's like, man, if I expose this, God's just going to whack me. No. He's not going to hit you. He's going to hug you. He's going to heal you. He's going to forgive you. You can be vulnerable. You can be open. Vulnerability, I, was, I, I did a little bit of research and, and they were talking about vulnerability, they said, is the birthplace for joy, creativity, authenticity, and love. It, it, it allows us to be authentic. It builds empathy. It breaks down walls. We forgive and are forgiven. It even builds resiliency, connection. That's what it does. And so as I confess and pray with one another, I, I'm healed. I'm helped. Right? And so we need to be those one another's that love, that forgive, uh, that are trustworthy. Then he goes on, and, I, and here's a moment of vulnerability. I realized for service, I missed this part of the verse. Duh. This is a really important part. Look at what it says. It says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does that mean? Effective and fervent is actually one word. Energeo. It's energy, right? It's, that's what it is. It's work. It's operating. It puts forth power. So, your powerful prayer, your working, effective, the effective, fervent prayer. If you do the work to pray, it's going to have a result. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. This is a person that has a right relationship with God. Right? I have a right relationship with God. Why? Because I'm forgiven. Because I've accepted Christ. So, effective and fervent, righteous, and then avails avails it has an effect it has an impact it has power it brings health even so the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much so he's saying pray and then he gives us an example so what does that look like this is a powerful example because he could just say pray but he's like here's a here's an example and he gives it in uh, verse 17 and 18 if you want to look in your bible it's actually in first kings you can read it later did I miss the fourth point if you're taking notes? I feel it. Zoe, thank you. I see that head nod. Yes. We confess and pray for each other. So that's what we do. What do we do? We confess and pray for each other. See, I have all kinds of opportunities to be vulnerable with you this morning, don't I? That's what we do. And frankly, that's what we don't like to do. Right? I don't want to admit that I missed a point. I don't want to admit that I forgot that. I don't want to admit, guess what? I do because I'm human. And so do you. And so what do we do? We pray. We confess. That's it. And, and then we're connected. And we have nothing to hide. So he goes on and gives us the example of Elijah the prophet. This Elijah the prophet example in verse 17 and 18. Elijah, he says, was a man with a nature like ours. A lot of times you're like, oh, I, these, these people aren't real. These Bible people aren't real. Elijah was a real person. Just like you. And what did he do? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months 
And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, if you don't know this whole example, I'll give you a real quick synopsis because it's really important. You can look in 1 Kings, as I said, chapter 18, tells the whole story. You can read it later. But King Ahab is a wicked king, and God sent Elijah to speak judgment to King Ahab. And Ahab was told, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain, right? And so, drought, judgment of God. I'll leave that for California, but that's it. So, drought was a judgment, Right? And, and, and God's like, hey, it's not going to rain till I say. And the prophet said, it's not going to rain till I say. And then God sent rain. Right? Why? Elijah prayed. Like, there's a mysterious connection between our prayers and God's work. And so Elijah, he's the servant of the Lord. And he goes, he's like, hey, it's going to pray. I mean, it's going to rain. When I say it's going to rain. And so what does he do? He prays. Now, I don't know if you remember the story, but he gets down on his knees and puts his head down between his knees and he's like, God, bring the rain. And guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. And he sends his servant out. Do you see any clouds? No, I don't see anything. Did he quit? No. What's he do? He prays again and again and again. By the third time, I would be embarrassed. Anybody, you know what I'm saying? You ever pray for something like a few times and... It's like, hey, I'm coming up for prayer again. And you're like, oh, man, God, please do something. Guess how many times? Seven. Seven times he sent his servant back like, okay, is there, is there any rain coming? Is a cloud coming? Is it working? And he had to pray seven times. That's why it says he prayed earnestly. Seven times. He kept praying. If you have been praying for something... And it hasn't happened yet. Keep praying. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know what God's going to do. But Elijah knew that God said it was going to rain. And that's the key. He knew the will of God. He was walking in the will of God. I don't know why God made him wait for seven different times. Maybe it was just for us. But he kept praying. And then God answered and sent a little tiny cloud the size of of a man's hands and Elijah's like that's it it's coming and he was out of there because the rain was coming we confess we pray and God works that's how it goes that's what it looks like and then he closes the last couple of verses here James closes his letter with this uh, comment he says brethren and I love that he keeps saying that have you noticed that throughout the time he keeps saying brethren brethren why it's family he says, family, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So he's like, listen, if you know someone that's wandering, they've wandered from the truth, maybe they're way off wander, they're in the next, you know, they're in the forest. Or maybe they're just like hitting the bumps on the road a little bit, driving by Braille. <laughs> However you're wandering, he's like, come back. Come back to the truth. Come back to God's family. Come back to that place where you belong. Because you do have a place that you belong. And that's with your family. You and I, we've been created to be in relationship. So the last point, what do we do as Christians? Someone is wandering, someone is walking away, we judge them. Just kidding. See, and if you're listening, no, we bring people back home. That's what, that's the ministry of reconciliation is, is God's like, hey, listen, this is what we do. We bring people back home, right? The prodigal son story, like when that prodigal son comes home, father runs out to meet him and bring him back. And, it, and when we when we find those that are wandering and we're able to bring them back, we're saving them from all kinds of trouble, all kinds of sin, all kinds of separation, all kinds of problems. And that is a good thing, that they live in a house and have a life that's safe and good and healthy and right. And that's the hope. That's the desire. So this morning is the first, uh, first Sunday of the month, and this is when we have communion. And communion is a perfect moment for us to stop and consider 
all that God has done. To seek and to confess our sin. To pray and ask for healing. So there'll be a couple people up here to pray with you. If you need some prayer, either now or after this last song, we'll be up for prayer. But communion is a symbol. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This this bread is his body. It's a symbolic of the body of Christ that was broken for you. And the juice is symbolic of the blood of Christ that was shed for you. For the forgiveness of sins and for your healing. And so anytime during this last song, you can get up and go over. Now, this is not for you to remember if you have not received Christ. If you haven't received Christ, then it's silly to remember something that you're rejecting. So just enjoy the song. But the other option is to receive. To realize like, man, there's a father that wants me to come home. There's a dad that wants me to to be safe. There's a friend that wants me to be healthy and come to Christ and confess your sin and be forgiven. And then remember that Jesus died and rose again so that you and I could be with him forever. So we're going to play this song. Take a minute, reflect, remember, uh, receive it, and then I'll come back up and we'll close together. Let's have communion.
Amen to that. Amen. So be it. That's what it means that we agree that we need him. We have a need. And sometimes we don't like to admit it. But it's a lack of admission that keeps us at a distance. So I just encourage you to confess, to draw near to give praise, to pray, that you make it a regular part of your pattern so that you can connect with people, with people that you're in relationship, people at church. This isn't just meant to be a come and listen. This is meant to be a come and do. Come and see and then Let's do it. That's, that was the model of Jesus' discipleship, right? Come and see. And then let's go. Let's go do it. So let's put it into practice. You know, not be the guy trying to schedule the honeymoon, but never actually do it. Right? That would be embarrassing. That story also, man, I just want to share vulnerably. Tomorrow's my anniversary. So not just mine, but Deborah and mine. So we're celebrating 30 years tomorrow. So thankful. She's put up with me for three decades. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of doing that has to get done to make things last. And this is going to rhyme, but, and to have fun. Right? So get the doing done so that you can have fun enjoy life that's one of our acronyms in the life acronym enjoy abundantly with joy and thanksgiving this that's a good place to be so that's my prayer this this week is that you know as you as you go that you would do that you'd find the joy in the doing that you'd see the fruit 
come from sharing and praying and, and opening up and being vulnerable and realizing that God wants to draw close and that God wants to draw near. And part of the process is that we would just be vulnerable and we would share with one another and we would share with him through prayer. So pray together, confess and love and rejoice, right? There's just so many good things in that. Let's let me let's just pray. I feel like there's I feel like there's people that are that struggle with that. It's like closed. There's a it's just closed, it's shut, it's not open. And God wants to do that work. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to soften our hearts to open up to a place to let you in to let you touch and move and speak and work and show that we would be open before you so that you could bring healing to us, that you could bring life and joy and peace and connection with the, all the one another's that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, coming up, uh, that rest is found in him, and that's where Joshua took the children of Israel in the promised land. That's where we're headed next. So God bless you guys. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great day.